So my name's Katie. Um, I'm one of the co-chairs for the pre-qualification group. Um, and I'm Liana. I'm the other co-chair for the pre-qualification group. Um, and this is our um, webinar for starting the Declan site in 2020. Um, hosted by Prequal, but we've kind of run this in collaboration with um, some other people. And I guess we just wanted to start by saying a massive congratulations to all of you for getting onto training. Um, no doubt it's been uh, a challenging, difficult, rewarding, um, exciting journey to get here. And you've done it, so um, well done. And you'll all be starting very, very shortly. Um, so we'll just start by um, kind of outlining what we're going to be doing tonight and um, kind of introducing some of the speakers for you all. So, we're gonna, so everyone's going to uh, join us now who are going to speak today. So you'll see lots of smiley faces that are about to join. Um, so as we said, we're um, just going to run you through kind of what's happening in the webinar and who's going to be speaking to each bit. So um, as Leanna and I have mentioned, we're the uh, co-chairs of the pre-qualification group. Um, I am starting training in September, which is very exciting, at Lancaster. And Liana? Um, yeah, I am going into my third year at the University of East London. And then alongside us in our opening and welcome, we've got Alex. Hi everyone, welcome. Uh, my name is Alex Marsh. I'm um, the ACP Director for Trainees and I'm a second year trainee at Cardiff. And we've also got Camilla. Hi, um, I'm Camilla. I'm a second year trainee at Liverpool and I am the mental health lead um, as part of the DCP's minority subcommittee. And then we're going to move on to how courses are adapting and um, Barbara's going to speak to us about that. Hi everybody, I'm Barbara Mason. I'm here in my capacity as deputy co-chair of the committee on training in clinical psychology and I'm also clinical lead at the University of Hertfordshire. And then we're going to move back to our trainees. So Liana, Alex, Camilla are going to be joined by Candice. Yeah, I'm Candice. I'm going into my second year at Hertfordshire and I'm the parent in need at the minority subcommittee. And then we're going to have a quick break and then we're going to be followed by the international trainees perspective um, with Sam. Hi everyone, I'm Sam. So I'm a second year trainee in um, UC of Exeter. So I'm an international trainee, meaning that I'm actually from Malaysia and do the training in the UK. And also Celeste. Hi, my name is Celeste. Um, I'm currently a year two trainee from UCL. Um, similar to Sam, I'm actually from Malaysia as well. And then we're going to have a, a good section of questions and answers. So pop them in the bottom and we're going to be joined there. Everyone back together, but joined with Tony. Hi, I'm Tony Lavender. I ran the Salomons course for 21 years a while ago, and I'm currently chair of the DCP Workforce and Training Group. And also Paula. Hello, I'm Paula. I'm the programme director at the University of East London for the clinical aspect of the course. And like you, I've only really known training in COVID times, so that's why I'm here. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, everybody. Um, and then we're going to have just some final remarks and hopefully we'll have answered everybody's questions. So we're going to move now on to the start of the webinar. So um, as we said before, this is kind of the um, collaboration group that we have. Um, so I guess um, the prequel group, uh, Alex as ACP director for trainees, um, Camilla within the minority subgroup. Um, and then we have uh, representatives from the group of trainers in clinical psychology and the workforce and training. Um, so we kind of wanted to run this group, uh, wanted to run this webinar um, as part of our group just to support you guys for coming into training um, during very uncertain times and um, when training is already kind of quite an uncertain thing to begin with. Um, lots of anxieties that can kind of come up for people just before so we thought um, hopefully we can answer some of those, um, especially the ones that are related to COVID. Um, but yeah, so we want to, as a group, support you. And if you can uh, kind of tweet about the event, use the hashtag DeclinSci2020. Um, and yeah, please use the, the Q&A box and the chat box as well throughout. So we're going to just tell you a little bit about the group. So I guess starting with um, thinking about kind of where the uh, collaboration group came together um, and I think Alex is going to give us a little summary of that. 
And so this collaboration group really came out of the uncertain context of COVID and the new challenges that face trainees and training providers in, in the context of COVID. Is that Alex's internet's gone? I think it might be. And that is the uncertain challenges of COVID. <laughs> I thought it was um, mine. <laughs> Um, so it looks like at the moment we may have just lost Alex. So what he was just saying is that um, as a group, we came together because we were aware that um, trainees in particular uh, were probably going through a really um, difficult period of time with all the uncertainties that were occurring in relation to coronavirus. Um, and so we had monthly meetings um, and we're going to kind of tell you a bit about what we've done in the past over the last couple of months and what we're hoping to do in the future. So we started meeting um, at the beginning of kind of COVID and it was different groups kind of coming together to try to think about um, training during COVID and it was sort of trainees and trainers um, perspectives joining up. The slides got lots of helpful things around some of the stuff we've been working on um, and as we're moving forward and kind of beginning to think about things that aren't such so COVID related we include things like um, the international trainees perspective and we're also beginning to think about um, stuff around um, sort of the Black Lives Matters movements um, for trainees who come from marginalised backgrounds as well as um, I'm just trying to think off the top of my head but so thinking about um, there's stuff around competencies and meeting them in the context of COVID so I think we've sort of talked about kind of neuro competencies and things like that. Um, so yeah, that's what I remember from the slides anyway. Yeah, I guess thinking back to the kind of beginning of the pandemic, it was so there was so much kind of fast paced change um, and tra uh, training was changing in kind of all different ways that we'll speak to in a little bit that, you know, um, placements were changing and teaching was changing, assignments were changing. And I guess there was a massive need for um, the different representatives to come together to think about how we can kind of support the trainee voice and also communicate those changes effectively um, from a more kind of broader national perspective. Um, and hopefully we can kind of support you guys as incoming trainees to, to feel like some of those uncertainties have been answered and some of those challenges are being heard. Um, within the prequel group, I guess we, um, we support a lot of people trying to get onto training and kind of once they're on training, we want to make sure that you're still feeling supported within the BPS and you're feeling like your professional body um, kind of understands your needs as well as the needs of qualified staff. Um, and then from the ACP, kind of Alex is providing a really great perspective of the work that they're doing and the way that they can support trainees as well. Um, and we don't have a poll, but I guess I'd just be interested to know people who've joined the webinar, kind of um, whether they're already BPS or ACP members and um, what support they've kind of already gained from uh, the minorities group or the prequel group or the ACP at all. Um, hopefully we can get our slides back up in a minute. They're coming now. Are you ready? I am very ready. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's jump through. Congratulations, everybody, again. Um, and we're going to jump through to what we've been doing here. Perfect. Which I think we've pretty much covered. Well done, Camilla. And what we've currently been working on again. Well done, everybody. And then just finally, uh, we're just thinking about some of the documents that have already been published um, over the last couple of months from the different professional bodies. Um, some of them are really important for trainees um, and the training community. And Barbara's going to talk a little bit more about some of them. Um, and so they focus both for individuals going into training, people doing the training, um, and all the individuals, including like the minorities groups within those. So there's a lot of different documents that will are available online for you to read, including all these ones as well. But don't feel overwhelmed. You don't need to read all of them, <laughs> but the ones that are relevant to you and are helpful, please read them there. Okay. Well done for everybody for getting through that. Have we got Alex back? I don't think so. We've not got Alex back. Okay. No, not yet. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. So let's um, move over and we are going to think about um, adjustments to COVID from the course perspective and welcome Barbara to talk to us about that. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Katie. Um, 
I'm here to talk to you um, really from the course perspective. So I'm here in my capacity as the deputy co-chair of the Committee on Training in Clinical Psychology, which is one of the BPS committees. And we're responsible for things like the um, developing the and setting the training standards for clinical psychology training programs and going and doing an accreditation visits um, to the different programs. I'm also going to draw on some of the discussions that have been taking place within the group of trainers in clinical psychology. I'm not here representing the group, but I've participated in many discussions, both in the director's group and in the clinical um, leads group. So I will draw on some of that as well to share with you, I guess, some of the things that um, different training programs have been doing to adjust to and cope with training in the context of COVID-19. Finally, I'm, I'm also going to draw on my perspective inevitably as a clinical trainer. Um, I'm the clinical lead on the Hertfordshire program. And so I will share some anecdotal examples as well from my experience um, working on the program over the last six months um, during, during COVID. So there are three key things that I want to focus on today. The first is just pulling out some of the, um, some of the key Guide, guidelines that we've had to draw on. The second is thinking about, well, what has this meant in practice? And the third is thinking about what is it going to be like for you as new trainees starting um, in, in September? So as we all know, earlier this year, we were faced with the most unprecedented change. Um, it, it impacted every single one of us, personally, professionally, in the workplace. Um, can I have the next slide? Thanks, Katie. Um, so we were all hit with um, newspaper headlines um, and faced with many changes and an awful lot of uncertainties in, in personal lives and in professional lives. And for us all, a lot of that uncertainty remains. And of course, is the, is the background or the lens through which you are all starting your training and embarking on this, on this new journey. So what has this meant for clinical psychology training? Can I have the next slide? So when lockdown happened in March, there was an immediate impact. And I'm sure all of my colleagues who are on the panel who've also lived through this will be able to speak to their own experiences of this. From a trainer's perspective, university campuses closed with a couple of weeks notice. And from one week we were hosting lectures and we had thousands of students on campus. And the next week, everybody was sent home. Um, there were no more, no more um, lectures in person. Students who lived on campus had to leave, um, which of course had a, had a huge impact on everybody. In terms of clinical placement, only essential workers were now um, enabled to, to stay. So for most of our trainees, what that meant was that they went from one week being there, working with their clients to the next week working from home. And for all of us, we were faced with the challenge of learning how to work remotely. And there were an awful lot of unknowns um, at that point. As trainers, we were faced with questions like, I mean, would training continue? How would training continue? Would trainees be able to continue on placements? Um, would psychology staff be redeployed to the Nightingale hospitals, for example? Um, you know, what was going to happen to clinical, clinical training? So many, many unknowns in, in those early first couple of weeks. But what followed very soon was an awful lot of action from um, the various professional bodies and certainly from the the trainees and from the, the training courses. Um, next slide, please. And what we landed up with very quickly was an awful lot of guidance. And um, if, if you haven't been introduced to it yet, this is where you start to see the number of acronyms that we all have to, um, we all have to work with. So the, the BPS um, was producing guidance, the DCP was producing guidance, the ACP, Associate Association of Clinical Psychology was producing guidance, the group of trainers in clinical psychology, psychological professions network, and so on and so forth. So there was an awful lot of work um, going on at um, this point, a real hive of, of activity, both to support psychological services and mental health delivery. 
So, you know, guidance about uh, mental health provision, about specific service user groups, about digital um, deliveries and so on, as well as some more specific guidance relating to um, clinical psychology training itself. And I'll, I'll focus in on um, three care, key areas of guidance that had probably the most direct impact um, for clinical psychology training programs. If I could have the, the next slide. So the first one was the guidance for psychological professionals during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, whilst this doesn't focus specifically on training, it was the first really important piece of guidance stating that training was important and should be continued. Because at that point, we were all a little bit unsure about the prior, how, whether training would be prioritized, whether our trainees would be able to remain on, on placement. But two key points were made in that guidance. The first was highlighting the importance of keeping psychological services open and that in the context of COVID, there was not going to be a reduction in the need for psychological therapies of various sorts, but probably an increase. And therefore, it was really important that those services remained open and delivering um, the services for which we're all trained to provide. And secondly, that it was really important that we maintained training, recognizing that the demand for mental health and psychological services was likely to increase rather than decrease. And therefore, that it was really important that we maintain um, our workforce so a focus on training, um, which was helpful. There were some, there were some other um, aspects in the guidance as well, um, th thinking about changes to remote delivery, um, about maintaining this psychological perspective, particularly in relation to COVID, thinking about prevention and um, treatment. And also at this point early on, highlighting the importance of um, staff support, both within the NHS and with, within social care um, as well. The second um, bit of guidance at this point that was really important for us as training programs was um, the guidance from the HCPC, the Health and Care Professions Council, who of course are responsible for the registration of um, many different health professionals, including um, clinical psychologists. Now, what was core within the um, guidance from the HCPC for, for us as training programs was the focus on flexibility, but within the context of maintaining the standards of proficiency, maintaining the standards of training and ensuring public protection. But what the HCPC did in their guidance was to give training programs the freedom to have the flexibility to make adjustments that were necessary to um, respond to the changes and the risks um, posed by COVID-19. So we were given, I suppose, the invitation to, to make changes, but very much to continue with training and to maintain um, the standards um, that were required in, in terms of um, standards of proficiency and also our, our training standards. Then the third bit of guidance that was particularly important at that point for training courses was, of course, the BPS guidance. Um, this is the guidance that, that I worked most closely on. Um, and the, the, this guidance was join, um, jointly produced um, with consultation with the group of trainers, as well as the Committee on Training and Clinical Psychology. And some of my colleagues here in, um, on the panel will also have been involved in developing this guidance. So if I could have the next slide, the key messages really within this, and so coming from our professional body to, to us as training providers was the need for flexibility, but that the flexibility related to how training is delivered um, and how the competencies were acquired rather than a, a dilution of those competencies themselves. So I, th I think this is really important and I'm, hope, I'm hoping that it will be reassuring to all of you starting in um, September that whilst as training programs, we've been, I suppose, given the permission and the, the um, scope to be much more flexible in our delivery, we're still very much working to this, the same competencies and level of, of, of um, competency that we always have done. Similarly, the, on the next slide, thank you, um, you'll still be expected to 
gain the same range of experience as are currently outlined in the training standards, but the methods by which you gain that experience might be a little bit different. So that was um, a, a key message within that, um, within that document. If we go on to the next slide, I'll just pull out a few highlights of some of the key areas. So underpinning this is first of all, that we maintain our duty of care to you as trainees, but also to service users, and that safety of practice has to underpin everything that we continue to do as training providers. Secondly, that trainee well-being and support of trainees has to be a priority. And thirdly, that whatever guidance the BPS provides, we as training programs also need to heed the guidance of the Health and Care Professions Council, the NHS, university regulations, and, and so on. And some of the key areas that were covered in that guidance were, for, first of all, research, acknowledging that um, trainees currently on tra placement might have to change um, how they were collecting their data, for example, that um, the ethics priorities of the um, NHS ethics committees had changed and that we therefore might have difficulty getting certain projects through and we might have to um, be more flexible and look at adjusting some of those. Secondly, there was an acknowledgement that clinical contact was likely to was likely to change in the context of COVID, so recognising that much of the work would be done remotely. At this point, um, the guidance acknowledged the need for using alternative methods, possibly working in alternative settings, um, possibly engaging in what was referred to as placement aligned activities. So doing things that might be simulations, for example, or set up by the course, but not necessarily on placement. So the guidance was giving us permission to be more creative and more flexible in how some of those um, clinical competencies were being developed by trainees. There was also acknowledgement that assessment might need to change. Um, so perhaps some of the methods being, being changed from, for example, live assessment to rather doing something via um, a simulation, um, for example, but always um, with the understanding that we'd need to follow university regulations. There was also um, acknowledgement of perhaps some changes in supervised practice, but again at the center of that that we maintain the current requirements so trainees couldn't suddenly not be supervised by a clinical psychologist or not having the, um, the the same requirements that we have now but there might need to be some flexibility so for example i'm um, having supervisory teams and then there was some guidance about leave of absence and how that would be managed as well as um, the possibility of redeployment Within this, the strong advice to us as courses, but also to trainees was to keep really good records and for everybody to keep a good log of the work that they were doing, especially if we were having to, having to change things. So what did this mean in practice? Let's, uh, if we can go to the next slide, thanks. And I think probably straight on to the one after that. I'm just going to give you an overview of, of some of the changes that have happened from the course perspective um, in, in training over the last six months and therefore likely to, to follow through for all of you who are starting soon. So first of all, on the academic front, well, what, what did all of this guidance actually mean? It meant for some uh, programs, some of the teaching became through reading, sending out PowerPoint slides, self-directed learning, for lots of programs, um, we were able to move straight to live online teaching, so much like this, things like webinars, live um, teaching seminars, um, and so on. Um, some work done in small groups, so we soon became quite adept at using breakout rooms so that trainees could still have their small group activities as part of their teaching. Um, many programs have continued to use problem-based learning or um, have developed problem-based learning tasks as a method of, of teaching. So I, I suspect that some of my um, fellow panelists might talk about this in a minute and give you some examples of, of what these felt like in practice from the trainee perspective. Um, but for us as course providers, we were really thinking about how do we enable our trainees to continue to learn 
in as best ways possible given the constraints and that we can't all be in the same room together. So using a variety of different methods. Um, I know that um, some have quite successfully done online role plays, use simulations and so on. Um, so there's been a lot of creativity. The other aspect of, from the academic side that we've had to think about as courses is whether we need to adjust our assessments. So some assessments like essays have been able to just proceed as normal, but other things like clinical practice reports might have had to have minor adjustments to the requirements. So for example, allowing trainees to write up a piece of work that might not necessarily involve direct um, clinical contact with a service user. So perhaps writing up about a leadership project or something like that. So there's been some flexibility and some need for adjustment to assessments um, within the academic program. At the next slide, so moving on to clinical placements. So for us as course providers, I think probably the first challenge was to just ensure that all of our trainees could continue on, on some kind of clinical placement. Now, depending on where the course was in their cycle, for some programs, what this meant was moving all trainees into one trust. Um, for other courses, it meant um, shifting all trainees into doing placement aligned activity managed by the course for the pe a period of a few weeks or, or perhaps a month or two. And for other trainees, it was, I mean, for other programs, it was really continuing with business as usual as best we could. So the first step was to ensure that supervisors were reassured and knew what was expected. Um, and then to think about about going forward how we ensure sufficient placements for our trainees. So managing both trainee and supervisor anxieties about this and very soon I think finding new ways of working um, which enabled trainees to continue their work on, on placements. So for most of us what that's meant is that trainees are working remotely, um, doing assessment therapies, attending team meetings via Zoom and MS Teams and such like. For some trainees, it's meant um, a combination of some remote working and some working on site. Um, so in some services, as I'm sure some of you will have experienced, they have a two week, um, a fortnightly rotation. So some staff are in for one fortnight and other staff are in for the next. So there's a combination. And then for other services, some of our trainees have continued working in person, but with um, PPE and various adjustments to um, ensure that it was um, safe for both themselves and for their service users. I think from a course perspective, um, one of the things that we've seen is a lot of creativity on the part of both trainees and um, placement supervisors in thinking about how to ensure that our trainees are able to still gain all of the competencies and experience but in a slightly different way. So working more flexibly, um, thinking about projects that the trainees could be involved in. We've seen trainees engage more in leadership projects, in learning and teaching and developing resources, but also in direct clinical work. Um, and I can think of a lovely example of one of my own trainees who's, who's been working as part of a family therapy clinic and they've had their reflecting team and their therapist and their family um, all working in um, using video conferencing technology and continuing to work um, therapeutically as they had done before, but in a slightly different format. So there's been a lot of creativity that we've seen. Moving on to research. There have certainly been some changes to projects um, to reflect changing NHS priorities and difficulties with getting things through NHS ethics, unless it was about COVID. So there've been some adjustments to projects. There's certainly been a shift from data collection in person to video or telephone um, data collection for things that would have been interviews. We've seen Vivas carried out via video link, as um, many of you would be, would be aware. And effectively what's been built in is some flexibility for current trainees and for new trainees such as yourselves, it will be much more about thinking creatively about your projects and ensuring that what projects you take on are ones that are feasible within the, within the, current, um, within the current context. 
Um, and I can answer more specific questions about that later if you would, um, if, if you have any you would like to ask. But I guess from a course perspective, it's very much been about balancing, ensuring that um, we meet both the training standards from a professional body perspective, but also the university um, requirements um, for things like research. Moving on, I'm aware that I'm starting to run short on time. There's so much to talk about. But another aspect that's been really important for us as trainers is thinking about support and thinking about how we support our trainees, how we support our clinical placement supervisors and how we adjust things. So one of the things we've been very aware of is the compensating for lack of informal support. So normally um, we would bump into one another in corridors and tea rooms, both trainees, course staff and so on. And so thinking about how we adjust for that um, to ensure that there is still sufficient support and contact. Of course, doing things like moving from those face-to-face -face conversations to having um, MS Teams meetings with trainees um, and similarly with supervisors. And one of the things that this has offered for courses is both challenges but also opportunities. So for example, there have been some courses who've started to run supervisor networking meetings, which have now become possible because of remote working, which previously wouldn't have been feasible to run over very large um, geographic areas. So there've been some things which in fact, I, th I think have probably been positive developments through this. Finally, from the course perspective, managing risk and additional needs, this is my next slide, We've had to think very much about how we balance the requirements of trust policies, um, things like employee risk assessments that the NHS require um, with university policies and ensuring that we keep our trainees um, safe in, in the context of, of COVID-19. There's been helpful guidance from the group of trainers which we've drawn on and that's focused specifically on keeping trainees safe on clinical placements. We've also needed to think about carer responsibilities that many of our trainees have, and I, I, th I think that some of my colleagues will talk about their experiences of that, but thinking about flexible working arrangements, also ensuring that trainees were able to um, have their key worker status recognised, so as um, trainee clinical psychologists employed in the NHS, you are recognised as key workers, and therefore trainees um, have had access to things like um, school-based childcare should they should they have needed that. We've also needed to think about trainees um, with specific health needs and disabilities, thinking about trainees who might need to be shielding and therefore ensuring that their placements were set up in such a way as to enable them to work safely um, and for most of them that meant working exclusively remotely um, from home. And then also thinking about our trainees from minoritized groups and the additional and further impact for them. Um, we, we know that um, COVID has disproportionately affected those from Black, Asian and minority ethnic communities. And that's um, true too for our trainees. So thinking about support, but also additional risk assessment should that um, be necessary and acknowledging the, the impact of um, family demands, family losses, family illness, and so on. So finally, I'm just about um, just about at the end, thinking about you starting training in 2020. Now my colleagues will talk more about this, but from our perspective as course providers, I think there's still many unknowns, if I'm absolutely honest. So from the perspective of my training program, we're still trying to figure out how many trainees we can have in, what size rooms will be available, whether we can do things in person, how much we have to do remotely. And I'm sure that this is the case for all of my colleagues on, on other training programs. So it's likely that there will be some variability across programs depending on the sizes of cohorts and how um, uh, programs are able to manage this in practice. We are all currently actively planning for the new academic year and really thinking about how we can ensure that you as our new trainees are still able to, to bond with each other, to have those starting experiences that you would normally have access to. And I know there's been some really interesting chat going on through some of our group of trainers forums where people have been sharing 
really creative ideas about how we might enable this for our trainees. So we've been thinking about um, people um, joining together in smaller groups and, and various other um, activities that might um, take place to ensure that, um, that you are all able to, I suppose, have the icebreakers and the bonding that we would normally expect at the beginning of training. There are many challenges, but there are also some fantastic opportunities. And I've certainly seen some really interesting learning and very interesting work going on on placement. Um, there's a lot of creativity that's been stimulated by this. So I think that there are opportunities for you as, as new trainees starting at this time. The other thing is that, you know, we've had six months of this and we've, we've learned very quickly. Um, as you can see by the proliferation of guidance and advice out there and support, um, there's a lot of work that's been going on and a lot that we've learned about how to enable placements to continue, research to continue and, and academic teaching to continue. And if I could have my final slide. So this is one of the trainee groups from my program from a couple of years ago. And I think it's not going to look like this in practice in October, maybe, because we're not going to be able to physically be present in quite the same way. But what we really hope is that we will be able to have this sort of um, physical presence and sense of cohesion before the end of your training, that, that we will work towards that um, for all of you. And that at the very least, you have the sense of, of community and belonging in a virtual sense, even if we're not able to stand together quite so closely as um, my lovely colleagues are in this, um, in this photograph. So I'm, I'm going to hand over to the next speaker. I will be here later on as part of the panel. So please feel free to um, ask questions if you'd like to. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Barbara. So we're just going to um, get Alex, Camilla and Candice um, on screen so we can kind of think about um, what kind of Barbara's talked about, but from our perspective. And I guess um, Barbara's done a really good job of outlining some of the areas we're going to speak to. Um, and I know that like as she was going through lots of different things were going through my mind about what that's been like for me and actually what that would be like for me if I was a first year as well. So it's sparked lots of um, thoughts that we can all talk to, I imagine. So um, I guess we just wanted to say as you're now on training um, that it does feel like you maybe. You might not finish. Uh, it feels like a really long journey. Will I, will I even be able to become a doctor by the end of it? And um, you will. We want to kind of assure you that um, it will feel like a long journey, but it will um, be a fruitful one by the end of it. Um, if we just go to the next slide. Um, and just in terms of some kind of pure statistics on it, um, there are really good completion rates for the, um, the doctorate course. So um, nationally, there's only a non-completion rate of about 0.6%, which is very different from like medical um, school and other things like that. Um, and generally that statistic thinks about um, if you're, you know, partway through training and you decide actually this career isn't for me, um, I think I want to change and do something slightly different rather than people um, getting kicked out of the course. It's very rare that that actually happens. Um, and yeah, so 92% of people took up employment as a clinical psychologist um, after they have finished. Um, and so it's a really high percentage of people who actually carry on being psychologists once they've finished the doctorate as well. Um, I know that some of these slides might look like information overload, but hopefully we can kind of just talk through them a little bit as we go. Um, so yeah, just in terms of actually starting um, the DCLIN in a few weeks time, there's just a few things I guess to think about. Um, and as we go through these slides, it will kind of look like generic things to think about. And then also um, thinking about things in relation to COVID. Um, and yeah, the, the first thing that comes up here, um, the handbook is your course Bible. And I couldn't agree more, I guess. Um, you know, at the beginning of the course, they give you 
they might keep referring to this handbook that is there and it will have kind of all the information available to you and um, usually um, kind of on the university Moodle page um, things like that and it will just it'll tell you about um, different percentages of assignments um, there might be dates for um, you know when assignments are due or when um, teaching is um, everything you need to know is typically in the course handbook um, I guess during COVID there might be obviously some adaptions that will happen this year um, so it might take a little bit longer for some of those things to be updated than usual um, in terms of meeting people as you start the course um, normally I guess there's kind of a meet and greet with trainees and um, all of the course staff um, face to face uh, for me it happened on our first day everyone kind of came through in a bit of a line and introduced themselves um, and you'll be able to get a kind of contact information for um, your personal tutor and your new supervisors and um, your line manager and all of those things um, but I guess as that will change slightly because of um, being remote um, we have a slide on that in a little while about what that might look like instead. Um, in terms of channels of support, um, there are yes, yeah, so many different avenues you can go down if you need support throughout your training. Um, so uh, yeah, your personal tutors and um, buddy system. So for me, in first year, you get assigned a second year as your buddy, and they've for me they'd also been on the same placement that I'd been on so I was able to talk to them about that experience and talk to them about assignments and um, you can also get a mentor um, you obviously have placement supervisors um, and there's obviously university structures for kind of well-being and support as well as um, kind of the professional body so us as the BPS or the ACP um, and then unions as well um, I guess we'll talk a little bit about support might be a little bit different um, remotely, but as it has been kind of six months, it'll be thinking about um, just how to connect with people differently and how to access that support maybe a little bit more flexibly than usual. Um, and then I guess the last one, uh, thinking about your development throughout uh, training. Um, imposter syndrome is one of the things that I know so many trainees kind of experience. Um, should I even have got on? Um, and I don't think that tends to go away throughout training um, as you kind of go on to new placements and do different assignments feeling, should I be here? Is, um, am I good enough? Um, but I guess rest assured that the, the course did choose you for a reason and um, you do have the skills and you do have the um, experience and the potential um, to be a trainee. And it is just about kind of developing that throughout and, and sitting with some of the uncertainty that, that comes with being a trainee. Um, I don't know if any of you guys kind of could talk to any of these points a little bit more. I think you've covered it all from my point. Yeah, agreed. I think you've done a nice summary today. Yeah. Should we go on to the next one? Um, so I think when you, I hadn't seen the gift before, um, but um, I think when you first start training, it's kind of meeting people overload. That's what it felt like for me. And obviously different courses have different numbers of trainees. So some courses, I think, for example, Banger used to have eight trainees on it. I'm not certain what it'll have now. Um, and then I think it's UCL, which has close to 50 trainees. So kind of the courses really vary in size as to kind of the cohorts. Um, but I think that for me, things like the WhatsApp group, I had a real love hate relationship and I was kind of known for stropping out of it at times when it all got too much. Um, but I guess what I would say is don't be afraid to kind of leave and then rejoin things like that. Um, but think about how you can include everybody because not everybody wants to be part of the WhatsApp group. So we also had a cohort Facebook group, but then not everybody's on Facebook. So kind of having different means of doing it. Um, but yeah, thinking about Zoom catch ups, it can be really difficult, especially during like teaching blocks when you're on Zoom a lot. But if there's a day when you don't have, say, much face to face teaching, can you schedule a lunchtime? And actually, if you can make use of the breakout rooms, 
where they're kind of randomly allocating you to smaller groups. So there's not say 30 of you all trying to button and speak, which can be really, really difficult. Um, meeting up, yeah, if you're on placement with trainees and that may be trainees on your course or different course. So for example, um, Liverpool has the Northwest course at so Manchester and Lancaster will share placement areas. Um, I know same for the North Thames courses and I'm not certain about like other, um, like whether other courses share placements as well, but um, kind of having WhatsApp groups or email conversations. Um, we've got at Liverpool currently a CAMS lunchtime group, which meets up occasionally. Um, so anybody who's on placement in CAMS, which is a smaller section of us, um, is kind of meeting up. I think there's also, because we're on the child placement, a sort of paediatric health group that are meeting up to do things like that. So kind of think about the different areas where you can be meeting people, even if you are on your own, on placement. Um, teaching, I think, has always been one of the places where you do get to meet people and kind of have coffees and things like this. And I think that um, sort of one of the things I really tried to do at the beginning was sitting in different places. And I guess that's not going to be possible per se, but kind of thinking about how you can meet different people um, that isn't just going to be the kind of cool people who you first meet on the first. I remember so sitting next door to a couple of people and the first week I really clung to them and then kind of after that, so slowly braved the way and kind of met other people. Um, but I guess one of the things I do want to say is kind of that I know at the moment not everybody is living in Liverpool for example and so whilst it's really easy to say doing face-to-face meetup um, that kind of there are restrictions I think I can't remember how many people are allowed to meet at once and stuff like this but obviously people who um, are in the shielding category or high risk or a carer as parents those people may not be able to meet up with you face-to-face -face, so kind of making certain that you are doing kind of online catch up so that they are included because I think otherwise it could be really really alienating and I know for the parents um in my kind of cohort can't go out for drinks at the end of teaching and things like this um you've also got um so it's saying like MDTs are online but kind of thinking about ways that placements and stuff like this when placements are online I know um that my current placement have got check-ins and actually it was really useful just going into the check-ins to say hi to people um, and it kind of meant that you got to know people in a more informal way um, oh I jumped ahead with the course whatsapp group because that's there but yeah definitely set boundaries at times it got really annoying and I would just leave them um, and then I'd come back in once the assignment had been handed in and people were like no longer stressing about it um, thinking broader than just kind of your immediate cohort kind of trying to make connections if possible and it's going to be a lot harder but kind of people in second year people in third year um and the kind of natural national training events is that i know kind of it peak lockdown kind of one of the peak lockdown moments for me was when there was the trainee quiz um which was a nationwide trainee quiz and somebody in glad it was a couple of people in glasgow who organized it and i think i can't remember how many trainees there were on there but i think they got nearly every course had at least one cohort representative um and so on so yeah, there's the social media and at the moment there's a Facebook group um, and I run the Facebook group, so I should really know the name, but it's something like Trainees and Clinical Psychology UK or something like that. Um, if you do ask to be joined, please, please, please say your training course and your year group, just like say coming into year one, because if you don't do that, you won't get added and you'll get deleted. Um, and then there's also a WhatsApp group, um, which you can just join, although there is a number of restrictions. And again, I will find the number at break time and put it into chat so people have got that number um, for you to join as and when you start training. And that's me done on that slide. I think me and Candice were going to talk on this slide. Um, but I think for me, the biggest thing about academic assessments is just being aware of how oh thank you lauren um that's facebook group going in and um, the academic assessments i think the biggest thing is kind of planning your time and knowing when it is for me it's about using my study days um and research days and different universities will have different quantities of them at different points and so on so it's not going to be this sort of one size fits all across. But kind of for me, that's been really, really helpful in not working 
um, evenings and weekends too much. I know some people do do it, but I think don't book annual leave to do an assignment because you will leave your assignment until annual leave. So I always tend to book a holiday um, so that I can't then do my assignment because I'm on holiday. And um, so it's kind of, if I've not got it done by then, then I'm going to have to get an extension. Um, so I try to get it done beforehand. Um, but yeah, thinking about that side of it, um, thinking about how you work and what's the best way of doing it for you. But I, I do think the biggest thing is not to stress. And I remember at Liverpool, and you see, this is where I'm really terrible because I said you shouldn't give me the academic assessments bit to talk about because I give everybody the fears. But kind of was that we were told that we could fail every assignment once and kind of, sorry, every assignment we could kind of fail at once before we got kicked off the course, which was really reassuring for me. But at the same time, I think it's kind of bearing that in mind, but also thinking about the fact that at some point over the three years, you will fail at least one assignment. And when that happens, it's not the end of the world because lots of other trainees will be in that situation. Um, and imposter syndrome is going to kick in. You're going to feel terrible about yourself. But trust me, you won't be the first. You won't be the last. It's kind of fairly common. Um, it goes back to Leanna's first point. And Candice, who is a lot more organised than me, um, hopefully will have some stuff to say. Yeah, so I've just, um, I've got lots of tables um, and different ways that I'm sort of trying to track what I need to do when um, so I suppose being a parent I'm very used to working either at weekends or when the kids have gone to bed and yeah just I suppose but trying to be flexible as well um, because things happen like sickness or I don't know just, it's just nightmares and the kids are up in the night and I've got to sort of try and work around that so I suppose my general advice is just to sort of try and try and use whoever you've got around you whether it's your cohort whether it's people in your sort of family or friends network and you know if, if you need to have time to be a bit more boundary and say look I need to spend two hours doing this thing then just just speak to people because people don't know otherwise and I think the thing obviously with training um and until you're on it sort of it is even quite hard to describe to people who are sit outside it so I've even got like a list on my fridge of like all the stuff that I've got coming up so if like if anyone notices I'm particularly stressed I just say to my behalf just look at the fridge because <laughs> that will tell you a bit about what's going on in my mind I'm just not able to verbalize it right now <laughs> um, so yeah yeah definitely I think just be as flexible as you can but work within your what you know is helpful for you and within your limitations well can i say something else as well is that you'll have formative and summative assessments or something like this and i don't can tell you which one actually counts one counts and the other doesn't count like use your time wisely if it's not going to count kind of put in the work and i'm not saying don't do the work for it because i will get lynched for saying that but kind of the work that actually is going to count towards your degree that if you fail, you are going to have to redo. That's the work that you should be really paying attention to. And the kind of other one is important, but it's less important. Yeah, I think, like like you said, Candice, there's something about knowing your, your working style and knowing what works for you. And I guess some people who are starting training now might have been out of academia for, you know, four, five, six years. So um, if you can think back to what it was like when you were doing your undergrad, um, my working style has not changed. I will be really organized at the beginning and then I'll get arrogant and then I'll slack off and then I'll panic at the end and then I'll hand it in two days before. I'll never be able to hand it in an hour or two hours before, but I know that that's my working style and that has not changed. So I guess coming into training, I had to remember that and work with that style and then plan mm -hmm. other things around it. You know, make sure you are still seeing friends and you are still having time away because otherwise you'll burn out um but it is about knowing what what your style is and being like transparent with your um supervisor and your personal tutor about that as well so they they're aware of that and they can kind of help guide you um with that 
Yeah, and I think that just made me think about even even if you do have a particular style, it's okay if that style changes as well. Because I think before I was always like, right, I'm going to aim to get this done by this date. And then, you know, whatever, something happens, and I'm just not able to. And then I have been in a position where I've submitted closer to the deadline than I thought I would. And, and I think that's just been an experience within itself. So just even just taking some time after you have submitted, just to have a think about, okay, what did I take from that? What could I potentially change up next time but also being aware that the context is going to change as well along with that you're going to be at a different stage in your training um but yeah i think just checking in with yourself that's what i was trying to get in a waffly way Mm. definitely so teaching um so teaching really varies across courses so it's really hard to kind of talk about this as a whole thing some courses kind of have blocks of teaching together whereas other courses kind of filter their teaching throughout um the year uh, and some do a mix but kind of what you get as a flavor is you get a real mix of teaching so some of the teaching is quite didactic where you're kind of just getting lots of information but teaching generally is quite different so um it's much more interactive there's a lot more interactive elements to it and um, they're much more on seminars obviously you're in a much smaller kind of group than you are necessarily in your undergrad or maybe in some of your masters um so so it's quite different at the moment it is very different because a lot of the teaching has had to change due to covid we're not going in as much and there's still definitely a large emphasis on virtual teaching and a lot of courses are kind of doing a flipped learning style so you're getting information ahead of time you can kind of read and the more kind of knowledge based components of it are kind of maybe offered to you a bit more and you're able to kind of review that in your own time uh, and the virtual teaching is kind of saved maybe for the more interactive components for some courses um i know that there was a lot of concern potentially around kind of missing out that i think lots of courses have been able to put adaptations and we've definitely learned a lot over the kind of last six months uh, and f- you know for us and i know for other trainees the use of breakout rooms is really happening. So you're still being able to engage in role plays. And if anything, actually it's really relevant at the moment because kind of doing a role play virtually really mirrors what you're kind of ending up doing on placement. And it's really nice to have the opportunity to kind of test those new skills out of like learning how to do therapy online in a kind of teaching session too. Um, and actually for some trainees, they're really enjoying the kind of flip learning style because it's really hard to kind of sit in a lecture and just have information dumped at you some, for some people. Whereas for, for others, actually they quite like to have that information given to them ahead of time. They can do with it what they want and kind of manipulate it. Um, uh, and then kind of engage in it and ask questions about it in a much more interactive way. Additionally, also, because it's been delivered online, a lot more of the kind of teaching is being recorded for courses as well. So you're able to kind of catch up, which is a nicer change. Um, In terms of who does it, that's quite different for training. So I suppose when you're kind of doing other academic courses, you kind of just get to to deliver teaching by lecturers. But on training, it's really nice that you do get a diverse range of people coming to teach you. So obviously you have the programme staff, but then you also have jobbing clinicians who are able to kind of give you really anecdotal stuff that's really helpful, um, kind of what it's like in practice. Um, Then also a, a lot of our teaching, where I am, but I know across courses, and this is a big requirement now for HCPC and CTPCP requirements is that you're getting taught by experts experience, people that have lived experience of of the the services that you're kind of learning to be a part of. And that's so valuable. It's such a nice, rich experience and it's very different to the kind of teaching that we've got before. Um, And at Cardiff, we've still been able to engage with that virtually, but I do know that it's been quite difficult for other courses to kind of carry that on at the moment. Um, and, and role play happens a lot and it's awkward <laughs> and it's really uncomfortable to start with but some people get really into it there's a kind of you know you really get to find your inner Shakespeare and, and, and your acting skills come out but it's really helpful to kind of do that ahead of time and I found it's given me a lot more confidence although I felt very awkward doing that initially in teaching and um, being able to just speak aloud what I was going to say in a, in a role play and kind of doing that on, on placement is really helppful and now because we're doing that in this virtual element it's, it helps a lot of face validity for what we're kind of doing on placement. Don't know if anybody else has any unique insights about teaching at the moment. I'm just going to say one thing that I would add um, in terms of sort of gearing up for quite a long day is just like the importance of like breakfast and lunch mm. and making sure that because I think what what I found is that it 
could be tempting to maybe book in other meetings during like lunch and then before you know I'm like it got to three o'clock and sort of my head just wasn't really in the game so yeah sort of trying to really be quite boundaried um, and think about what you're eating and whether you're drinking enough and things like that because yeah it is a, it takes a, quite a lot of energy to stay focused um, online for a significant amount Absolutely. of time. Yeah. yeah. And I've noticed the sneaky pressure as well to try and maybe write like a letter whilst I'm doing teaching or because it's on Zoom and, and you just can't do that. And I think it's really important, like you say, kind of not only with that kind of self-care element, but also to give your permission to yourself to be in teaching. There's so much pressure now, isn't there, to feel like you should be doing everything at once because you're able to a bit more. But um, I think, yeah, making sure that you are looking at yourself in that way and giving yeah. yourself permission to do those things. Yeah, there's definitely something about, I'm sure everyone has been developing their own like working from home styles. But if you're going from a job that has been still going in and now you're going onto like a month long block of teaching. Yeah, thinking about whether whether permitting you can like go out in the morning, get some fresh air. And I know for us, our teaching, we kind of have like an hour and 20, then we have a break, then we have another hour and 20, then we have lunch. So it is good that they kind of break it up that way and make sure you are, yeah having enough coffee, you have enough snacks around you, all of those things. Um, and I guess one thing for, for our teaching, we only had one virtual lecture before our term ended, but um, the, the use of like a chat function has just enabled so many people who don't really have the confidence to speak up in a room full of 30 people just to kind of share some of their views. And I've really valued like um, being able to hear from, from other people and have almost a discussion on the side of the lecture, although it can feel quite information overload. So it's just about trying to manage your, your concentration as you, um, as you go, really. Um, so research, um, Barbara's already done a really nice kind of talk about what's happening in terms of research. There's been, and she's discussed some of the really helpful adaptations. I think um, for us currently undertaking research, we've had to uh, some of us think really creatively about how we adapt to that. But I think moving forward now that we've got a lot of those lessons learned, um, I think for the incoming cohorts, there'll be lots of really rich ideas. And I suppose actually there's so much innovation going on at the moment because of COVID, there's, there's a scope of research for kind of doing that. Um, I think for trainees, NHS ethics is a bit tricky at the moment. And so there has been a swap to kind of looking at more student populations or utilizing kind of open access pre-existing data or kind of doing it over the phone, those sorts of things. But really, I think the message for us, for you guys at the moment, is this isn't something that you should feel particularly pressured about in your first year or coming in or particularly concerned about. Your first year really focuses on kind of key clinical skills. You have a small research project that you can complete in your first year, but doesn't necessarily have to be. And so, um, so don't really feel like you need to be hitting the ground running with research as you come and you've got plenty of time to kind of think about this and consider it as you kind of move forward throughout your training career. We're going to have to do an <laughs> uh, just mindful of time. Um, was I doing these slides? Yes. Can't remember. It was meant to be Candice and me, but you can go for okay, it. Go. No, go for it. Uh, Candice, you start. Um, I suppose so my experience of placement has been perhaps different to sort of the majority of my cohort. So I've been um, based on an inpatient ward and yeah, so it adapted to to using PPE and sort of all of the considerations that come alongside that sort of just making sure that the person you're speaking to can actually hear you because it is it's yeah it's an adjustment process um we're in a mask for quite a long time um and I suppose for me the main thing is, is just in terms of um my kids and sort of making sure that I've got the the childcare when I've needed it so um speaking to my course tutor and having that support as meant so much during this process and um, the support of my supervisor has been amazing as well and I suppose just trying to keep those lines of communication as open as possible because yeah that's that's just been yeah brilliant for me um but I suppose it's just again looking after yourself in those moments if you are going into a placement and perhaps you know you're thinking about yourself and, and people around you and you know there's all those different emotions that, that come along with it and sort of the element of risk and things like that again just reaching out to people speaking to people and um speaking to a cohort trying to connect with people is really important during those moments and i think just yeah continuing to check in throughout 
around how you're feeling. Um, in terms of, sorry, now I'm just looking at the list again, um, sort of caseloads and things like that. Um, again, trying to be creative with that. So, you know, what, what can I still do given the guidance? So I've been doing some groups. So sort of, again, trying to think about the numbers, being mindful of numbers and just really using the support of the team to have a think about what, what we're doing from a psycho psychology psychology perspective and if there are any ways that we need to be a bit more flexible given the current context. I think for me one of the big things that I would say like looking back in hindsight and this was kind of to my first placement which was obviously face to face was that I felt there was a lot of pressure to kind of tick all the boxes of the course and to kind of get this done and that done and I remember kind of we were told really try and get your CBT tape done on your first placement because it's the easiest one to get done and stuff like this. And I think I kind of really tried to do that. And I think looking back, for me, my supervisor's natural inclination wasn't CBT and things like this. And I think that actually kind of going with my supervisor more would probably have given me a better placement experience than kind of thinking, oh, the course says I need to do this and the course says I need to do that. Because the reality is, is that friends who didn't manage to get a CBT tape done in that first placement for example have had opportunities to do it on like later placements and so on so that's kind of I think my first thing is don't feel if your supervisor kind of isn't what the course is saying they're going to be and no no supervisor is always going to be all singing all dancing matching up to what the course is kind of going to do then don't worry about it too much um, I think second thing is that when we first started and kind of for anybody who was in work six months ago when kind of COVID kicked off everything had to change overnight whereas kind of it's six months in and I think supervisors are much more used to it a lot of the supervisors are going to have had trainees for six months kind of will know what's working what isn't working and so thinking about that side of it and I think although at some point kind of remote working will become less kind of remote working is going to be here to stay going forward and so actually it's a really good skill to be kind of picking up on training um but i think for me the biggest thing is about somebody who has worked remotely is just trying to connect with your team in whatever way it is and sort of making a bit more of an effort sometimes to kind of go to those kind of check-ins if they're on offer or that side of it um but not being too stressed and something that i was told by um, my personal tutor was kind of just log everything you're doing in a way that you probably wouldn't normally do so if you're kind of making a shot if you're shadowing somebody or you're doing an observation just make a record of that because you will probably have less clients and caseloads and things like this potentially than normal. So if you can actually say, well, I was in this MDT or I kind of shadowed that appointment or this assessment, you can kind of show those skills. And actually through doing all of that, it has kind of helped. I think that's it for me in kind of placements. So, yeah. yeah. And I think that we're now going into the break, aren't we? Yeah. So we can um, have five minutes okay so we're just going to go into um our next section of the evening with sam and celeste talking about the international trainee perspective um hopefully katie is back so she can change the screen yeah <laughs> perfect hey. Thank you. So thank you for everyone coming back. So Celeste and I are just going to talk about our sort of experience of being international trainees in this DCLEAN program. Um, so we were thinking about sort of introduce like what does international trainees mean? Um, that's the next slide. So we kind of identify ourselves as international fee paying trainees or you heard about um, people saying that international self-funded trainees is because we are from non-UK or EU national and without state like settled status in the UK. So we can come from all kinds of part of the world to come to do this training. So also something to highlight is that we are actually not funded by NHS. It means that during these three years of training, we actually need to fund our own training and also cost of living, um, travel, uh, travel expenses as well. So all these things, it, it kind of only unique to international self-funded trainees. So a lot, not all universities actually offer space to international applicants, and there's only 14 universities actually allow international um, applicants to apply to the university. So you can see on the, the slides there that those course center are the one that offering um, placements or training to international applicants. So on the 14 UNC that offer position for international self-funded applicants, there are currently about 40 to 50. 
we can't really get the exact figure at the moment because some of the units actually ask them to apply through the uni and some actually ask them to apply through clearinghouse. So this 40 to 50 uh, international trainees figure is actually get from clearinghouse. So if you divide to 14 UNC, basically like um, each UNC, there would be only three international trainee. It means that each cohort, there's only one international training. So we are actually quite a small cohort. So, um, and also during this COVID-19 pandemic, when it happens, like the lockdown happens to a lot of countries, it kind of makes us as international trainees unable to go home and even going home is no, not that easy anymore. And therefore during this period of time, um, I kind of start out the Facebook group and trying to network with all the international trainees is trying to um, provide them a little bit of support. And we sort of also have a monthly Zoom meeting, like a money dropping sessions, um, just to kind of have a reflective group and talk about the challenges that we face and talk about our experiences as well. So the next slides is kind of show us a unique experience that kind of encounter by international trainee. So I kind of separate into different sections. So it kind of give you an idea about what's the, uh, what's the unique experiences. So for example, before arrival, we need to do a lot of these applications. We need to get essential documents. We need to get the police checks and then immunization records. We also need to prepare ourselves to sort of move countries. So we need to sort of um, say goodbye to all our friends and family and actually basically just pack ourselves and just bond to the plane and just fly over here and start a new life. Um, so when we arrive in the UK and before the course starts, there's a lot of things that we actually need to sort of um, prepare as well. So we, the first thing, the most important thing is actually to find a place to stay. So you can kind of get the UK address, then only you can sort of um, register, um, get the DBS sorted out, get your bank account, um, currency and driving license. So all these things sort of when we need to sort of like um, set the downs and before the course started. So a lot of international trainee has to come about two weeks before the course start just to get all these things sorted. And during when it start training and the teams that come out a lot, it actually shows that we still are very unfamiliar with the whole NHS system. There's a lot of sort of um, jargons and things that we are actually not really familiar with. And also the expectations of placement supervisor can be quite different because we don't have sort of NHS experiences um, and a lot of our, um, sort of our clinical experience are come from a very diverse group. So let's say, for example, for myself, I actually work for refugee and asylum seekers when I was in Malaysia. So when I come to the UK, actually, I don't really have a lot of NHS experience, even though I did my master here. But even though we don't have those experience, but what we can contribute is differences as well. So I do find that my experience as working with um, refugee and asylum seekers kind of give different view to people, but also um, it's something that as an international trainees can bring into the course. So next thing I want to talk about, it's sort of a, quite a big team um, for us as an international trainee is going home, especially during this um, COVID-19 pandemic. It's not really easy to go home. So usually we need to take a longer lift, like for example, myself, that I hope I can spend more time with friends and family. But for me to travel home, it took me 24 hours. So if you 24 hours fly back and 24 hours coming here, it's about two days gone. So we tend to take a longer annual leave, but then we need to plan our leave accordingly as well. So we try to find time that we can take a longer leave, for example, Christmas time, Easter time, or end of the course. Um, so most of us actually can only go home once a year. Um, but with the COVID-19 uh, COVID situations, actually a lot of training has been sort of like here because they whenever they fly back or coming like, need to self-quarantine for 14 days, it's just a bit impossible. So because based on all the teams, we just feel like perhaps we should start doing some survey to really get an idea about how everyone experiences. And we actually get a quite good response. So we have about 40 to 50 people in our Facebook group. And then actually we just set up the survey and ask everyone a lot of questions. Um, and we get actually we get quite interesting results. So I guess the last going to be start talking about the next slide about our source survey result report. Yeah, so um, we started off doing this survey with just a genuine interest to find out how international trainees adapt um, in their first year. 
Um, reason being like what Sam has highlighted, um, the four, three factors, or rather the three stages we need to go through to be to adapt to UK and the training. Um, what I want to highlight as well is that we can't come to UK any earlier than three weeks before the course starts. And we can't, um, and before that, we can't start gather, gathering all the documents and paperwork in our home country as well, because all this is beyond our control. We, we need to get a cast number, which is something to apply for a visa from the uni. And then with that number, then we can get our logistics done. So there's a lot of waiting. And there's a lot of rushing before we leave the country to get here. And when, once we get here, we also need to rush around um, to settle all the things before the course starts. So with that in mind, we were quite curious about um, whether other shared experiences with other international mm -hmm. trainees. So based on the survey, what we found is that um, 70% of the international trainees across the UK have not been in the UK before. So this is actually the first time in UK and they come here just for just to study here and six about 68 percent of them reported that they are not very supported throughout the process to transition into the course which is quite shocking um, and then it, it's revealed that um, about 90 percent of them do not know much about NHS system and what to expect in an NHS system and 68 percent of them said that um, they were not given any information from the course to help them transition to the NHS as well. So I guess that creates a lot of um, confusion for international trainees because we are trying to grapple with, um, we are just trying to grapple with a lot of things at the moment, transitioning and trying to understand a different culture, be it academically or language or weather. We also need to adapt to the weather as well. Yeah. Um, so that's quite an interesting survey. And from that, um, it actually led on to a lot more projects that we are currently doing. Um, so we have disseminated the studies, I mean, the results to some universities. Um, interestingly, they took, um, they are quite concerned um, and they're quite supportive um, in helping us to raise awareness and to help to um, bridge the gap between what is reported in the findings. So right now, um, next slide, please. Thank you. So right now, actually, some of the courses has come out with an international trainee resource pack just to help international trainees prepare the transition before they leave their home country. Um, and I thought that was very useful. And then the international trainees group that is out there to support fellow international trainees um, what I want to really highlight is that don't be afraid to share your experiences and challenges um, you encounter in the course, speak to your peers, um, speak to the course staff if, need, if necessary, because the course won't be able to help if they don't know that you're having challenges. Um, so a lot of us actually have to negotiate our needs um, with the course, especially during the pandemic. So for instance, some of my peers, they are actually doing their placement from their home countries um, with the time difference and all. So the course and the trust are actually quite understanding in, um, in helping us. So um, I think that once any concerns or queries is raised, it can be solved. So that's something that I want to highlight. I guess um, we, we sort of need to take into like some cultural differences on how we approach people and asking for help as well. And we noticed that quite a huge team as well, isn't it? So um, that's the things like people are sort of like afraid to ask for help. But actually the course itself is really, really helpful because I do ask for a lot of help. And I feel like if I can't, I didn't ask for help, I won't be able to sort of survive my year one as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that in general, what I learned in these two years um, of training is that, you know, you are in safe hands. The yeah. courses are really very supportive and it's very nurturing. Um, mm -hmm. If you have any ideas, any feedback, that they will take it on board and they will try to find solutions out of it or they will try to improve as well. So I think yeah. that eventually we will be fine. Everything is going to be fine. We do have like a Facebook group. So in a way we want to create sort of a community for um, any people with an international background. So in the Facebook group, it's, it really depends on your international background, but the group is mainly 
um, more on international self-funded. So a lot of team is around self-funded international trainees, but we are welcome anyone in international group just kind of like want to get a sense of support and community and talk about things. Um, so yeah, do reach out um, to connect with different people. And I think one of the things that because we are such a small cohort in some UC that only have one or two international trainee. So it's really important that we can speak to other trainees in other courses as well. So we can kind of feel like actually in this journey, you are not alone. So yeah. 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 I think to add on, um, even just be curious about what we can offer as well, because I thought that, I think that reflecting on my own journey a little bit, I think that um, a lot of trainees, I'm quite glad a lot of trainees are very curious about my background and what, how things, how healthcare is being delivered in the different countries. So through conversations, we learn how to um, have a different perspectives about treatment modalities and how do we adapt particular treatment to yeah. different client groups and to different countries as well. So I thought that is something quite interesting yeah, that international cool. trainees can yeah. offer. It goes both ways and they're quite interested in how we are. So that's the reason why they ask us questions. So similarly, if we want to know more about um, the NHS system or how um, the training here, we actually can ask them as well. And I have a very lovely bunch of cohort really support me through my first year as well. And they taught me a lot. So they also kind of be very mindful about where I come from and try to support me as well. And sometimes it's okay to bring out difficult conversations. So I remember this one time I just say that I have to say that um, I don't agree with a lot of things that's because of my background, where I come from, but I actually really want to know more. So if anyone can kind of explain to me, so kind of, kind of sort of um, allow them a permission, give them permission to ask questions as well. I think this is really, so just be curious. I really feel like be curious is a good word to really help us to really understand each other's needs as well. Yeah. So I guess that's sort of like the end of our international trainee perspective sharing. So we're going to move on to the panel Q uh, and A session. So yeah, I think we all need to. Yeah, great. Thank you, Sam and Celeste. That was fantastic. Uh, we're going to welcome everybody back. Um, apart from Liana, because she's had to leave us. Um, and we're going to go on to some of the Q&As. So I will get that up. I think looking at uh, what we've had so far, a great one to maybe start with that uh, Tony could support us with um, is to say thank you to Tony for working on it and with the other colleagues, but to think about um, the increase in places um, that have happened this year. Okay, uh, probably the biggest single reason is a thing called the NHS Long Term Plan, which um, envisaged much more psychological input in, in services. And in order to provide that input, there was uh, quite a, a sort of internal pressure within H NHS England and HEE to increase the number of um, psychological professions, including... Um, uh, clinical psychologists, uh, indeed the child and adolescent psychotherapists programs increased by 25% as well and there's been increases in IAPT and all those other psychological therapies so it's part of a long-term um, development but it is something we've been working on for quite a few years to try to lobby for an increase. Um, um, probably the most significant significant thing is that we have there's been nationally created a psychological professions workforce group and we have people who are taking leadership roles in NHS England um, and are much more part of the sort of decision making process than we've had for um, quite a few years. Just a, a word on the COVID, I think it's been recognised how well uh, clinical psychologists in particular, but the psychological therapies community has responded to COVID. So I think it really helped create an atmosphere where arguing for more uh, clinical psychologists was much easier. But that's helpful. Thanks, Tony. Um, I should have said that I'm going to um, chair this little section just because I'm hoping that I can be a bit of a voice for all everybody watching. 
uh, that's coming into training in September. So um, we will move on to the next question. Um, I have seen that some of it's been answered, but let, I'm going to raise it so that hopefully it can be um, spoken about more widely. Uh, somebody's asked about thinking about their competencies um, and studying during COVID. Um, are there any thoughts about how trainees might be supported if their health puts them in a vulnerable position with relation to COVID? Um, Paul, you've, you've answered on the chat. I don't know whether you want to start and then if anybody can add, that would be great. Yeah. So it's certainly something that all the courses will want to know if you're shielding or um, living with anybody who's shielding. Uh, we do have a responsibility to keep you safe and um, your family members. So actually on in, within the North Thames, so UEL, UCL, North Holloway, um, we have been able to largely place people who've been um, uh, sort of deemed to be at uh, risk of COVID or more vulnerable to COVID or have been shielding in remote placements so that they can um, sort of mitigate against any risks really uh, and still complete the course. Uh, so you know there's a lot of opportunities it links with another question that somebody said I think it was Solin who had asked whether sort of different opportunities and different um, services had opened up as a re result of Covid and there definitely have been so working through occupational health working on staff anxieties around Covid um, and also sort of Covid related anxieties within the community so working you know in a sort of secondary care kind of adult service so these new services have sprung up actually haven't been as well used as you might imagine but it's been interesting work nonetheless thank you anybody got anything to add just i suppose just to to echo some of that um we we would certainly always want to consider any trainees with um, specific needs um and, and i think just to reassure trainees that there are standard sort of processes in place that we that are equally relevant in the context of COVID. So we would be thinking about things like reasonable adjustments in relation to whether they were COVID related or any other kind of special needs related to um, disability, for example, so that there are systems in place that we would be actively using in order to support trainees who have any other other needs. I was just going to say the minorities group um, made a publication, so I've put the link to that in the chat. It's not trainee specific, but it covers everything. But um, I haven't had any adaptations through COVID, but I have had like reasonable adjustments on placements yeah. and stuff. And I think just speaking to the course tutors where possible, um, as early as possible, so that they they can know in advance. Because if they place you somewhere and then you can't do that placement, it can kind of make more work type of thing but kind of speaking to them in advance but yeah fantastic okay i'm going to move on to the next question which kind of ties in about competencies um, and people being slightly concerned about whether um this cohort but also all the trainees currently in um placements and things are going to actually meet the competencies um that are required um and there's a particular note about the neuropsych assessments. Mm. Alex, do you want to speak about the neuropsych bit that we've been working on already to start us off? Yeah, um, so we, um, so uh, I suppose both um, Liana, Katie and I as kind of trainee representatives are quite engaged with the current trainee community and are really listening to this and this is something that's come up to us through that. So we kind of brought it to our collaboration group and we've, um, we're interested in working with the DUN to think about how we can adapt and think about how we attain neuropsychology competencies within training. I've had some personal experience of this, so I've done some virtual testing so far. Um, but I think if you haven't had neuropsychology experience before, it's quite challenging to learn both how to do a neuropsychology test and to do it online. And so I know that adaptations are being thought about that. I'm also, as part of my cohort, part of a kind of um, task force to think about neuropsychology. And I know that certain courses are planning on using, for example, those opportunities where they can do face-to-face -face teaching to think about what does that face-to-face -face teaching need to look like? For example, delivering teaching on how to um, learn a test is really interactive, isn't it? That's one of the things that might, some courses play more emphasis on having face-to-face -face, as opposed to some of the stuff that can be delivered more easily virtually. So those opportunities for face-to-face -face teaching can be 
kind of shifted towards neuropsychology competencies. But I think it's definitely something in our sites and we're going to be trying to work closely with the DON about how we adapt competencies. There's lots of other ways that you can kind of meet your neuropsych needs that aren't your conventional, you know, um, kind of testing. And I suppose we're using psychometrics all the time as well, aren't we? It's not always performance-based psychometrics. There can be subjective psychometrics like using a, uh, a Beck Heath inventory or, or whatever. It's still showing that you've got those um, underlying neuropsychology competencies around assessing change and, and those sorts of things. The ON is Division of Neuropsychology. Thanks, Katie. Sorry, me falling into the acronym. Tony? Really? I'll just say one of the things that um, Higher Education England asked us um, quite quickly is how well we were adapting, the, uh, we, clinical psychology, was adapting the training. And I think we've hardly had any difference in terms of people qualifying this year over previous years. Mm -hmm. And that is extremely different from medicine, nursing, all the, all the other allied health professions as well, which have had a significant delays in, um, in the finishing. And I think it's something to do with the sort of adaptability of the community. And I think as trainees, it's important that, you know, you'll be our colleagues pretty quickly mm -hmm. And you can play a role in helping those adaptations and sort of learning um, uh, during during this time. So there are a lot of things that we'll be developing, like more sophisticated ways of um, developing the remote testing. Um, and the other thing is, you're on the course for three years from September. Mm. Nobody's predicting that a vaccine won't be developed in under three years. Mm. They're all saying a year is too quickly. So I think the, there is a chance during the time you're on the program for things to uh, shift in terms of mm. the pandemic. They won't completely go back, but they'll, um, they're, they're likely to shift. And I'm just to sort of, sorry, add again from the sort of Noro, um, perspective of things we sort of had a simulation that was geared towards doing neuro so we sort of got to test it out sort of there and then um with um lecturers and sort of members of the cohort as well which was a great sort of practice run and then a few of us in the cohort also set up like an extra space where we were able just to practice with each other um online as well so yeah i mean i would like to just following up on what candace said is that I think our experience to date is that trainees and supervisors have been really creative um, and in, in finding new ways of, of learning and developing those competencies. Um, I can think of an example of a trainee who's done a fantastic piece of work in adjusting and adapting some of the psychometrics to use um, in, a, in an online format and that's been great learning for that trainee. I think just sort of returning to the broader question, we have to ensure that you are competent enough to qualify as clinical psychologists, that's our job. And that's what the BPS training standards require and that's what the HCPC standards require. So it's kind of on us to ensure that you have the right range of experience and you, that you develop those competencies. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the headache we need to hold <laughs> rather, than, rather than you, you can expect it of us. But my experience so far is that um, trainees and supervisors and tutors have been wonderfully creative in finding ways and new ways of, of learning and, and developing competencies and really extending quite beyond um, what they would have done before in, in many ways as well. So I feel pretty confident that you guys are, you're going to get a different training to what you would have had five years ago, but that you're going to get a really interesting um, and robust experience. And as Tony has said, yeah, it would be, yeah, it, I, I think it's unlikely that you won't have the experience of some face-to-face -face working during the course of your, of your training. Thank you everyone. Okay. Um, I've just noticed a question that I think is really um, exciting. Okay. So what is your recommended reference manager, management mm -hmm. software? Go. <laughs> I've noticed Alex put Zatera. 
Yeah, it's a Tiro. It's definitely the one I go for. It's so handy. You can access all of your references wherever you are. So, it, you know, if I was at work and I was thinking, oh, there was that really good article that I read the other day, you can just log in online and it pulls the reference up for you. So that's quite handy. But I would definitely, if you're not familiar with reference managers, I definitely recommend you, you kind of do a little Googling about them because they are lifesavers when it comes to academic assignments. It's, and, and particularly your thesis as well, it's so much easier. It's on my list to do, to learn about <laughs> reference managers. Um, I would say in terms of like learning how to cite, my particular library gives you a little like cite option and you can click it and go to the APA and copy it so you don't have to type. Um, but the only hint I would give is as you write your essay, put in the references and don't like leave them to the end. But yeah, Satoro or whatever it was that Alex was recommending. Yeah. Anyone else? No? Moving on? Moving on. Okay. Um, some people have asked, um, are there any new placements that have come out now that um, kind of throughout the pandemic, whether there's new placement options? I don't know whether Pavel or Barbara mm -hmm. spotted that in their courses. Uh, for, for us, um, definitely placements configured in new ways. Um, so, for example, we've had um, some trainees start to work together and, and run a joint project, even though their placements are actually in different parts of the county. And so previously, they, it wouldn't have even occurred to them that they could work together. Um, and now the supervisors and the trainees have kind of teamed up and they do it running some really great projects together that wouldn't have been feasible for one trainee on their own. So. Um, less completely new placements at the moment, although there probably are, are some with more of a staff support focus, but very much um, added layers of possibility within existing placements. Tony? Um, just hearing from uh, people around the country, it seems that some, um, it, uh, as Barbara said, it's not necessarily whole placements, but new opportunities within placements have occurred. So somebody may work for a day a week in a resilience hub, which is essentially set up to provide support for those staff, particularly those staff who've had a lot of sort of frontline uh, experience of dealing with COVID people and dealing with deaths, both of their uh, of patients they've been looking after, but also their colleagues. So I know a number of trainees have done some work in that, which is, uh, I mean, it's not completely new in what people are doing, but it's a kind of completely new area, especially with these uh, resilience hubs so that, that are springing up. I'd also echo what Barbara said about uh, opening up opportunities, even conventional opportunities on placement. Mm -hmm. So I've been able to run a virtual group that practically would have been very hard to have run my yeah. placement because mm -hmm. of like moving around and running into different buildings. And so I've definitely, and I know fellow trainees have shared that, that actually there is, there is some advantages to uh, the way that we're working at the moment. It's definitely opened up more placement opportunities for us. And I've been able to engage in service development work that I wouldn't have been able to, mm -hmm. to conventionally engage in in this part of my training. Just one other point that I think some of, you know, the, it has speeded up remote therapy and the use of remote therapy, like remote meetings. Um, and I think for some people that's made access easier because yeah. in some parts of the country in their very rural areas, it's actually difficult to get to the clinic or the base. Um, and because of the public transport not being a kind of brilliant. So it has meant that things like attendance surprisingly in some places have actually gone up rather than you sitting having yeah. more dnas yeah. so I, I think we have seen some kind of advantage and as for professional meetings i think there will be the most radical change because electronic meetings were a rarity now all the meetings the that kind of national meetings yeah. um, are happening via zoom and it's saving travel, it's saving time, it's increasing attendance. So I think you're going to see more of those national professional meetings being yeah. uh, online. Yeah. I think what's been lovely about that as well is that this group was formed yeah. because, because of exactly. a virtual world that we were able to enter together. We, we, wouldn't, Sorry, be doing, we wouldn't be doing this now. 
<laughs> had we not made this change. It's absolutely a reflection on one of the advantages of having 235 people from all over the country all together participating in the same event. Um, I would echo what Tony said. My experience in some of the national work is that it's enabled us to work so much more collaboratively and so much quicker on things like guidelines, on sharing practical advice. Um, you know, it's, it, yeah, I, I think there are many advantages from, from that perspective. Um, yeah, so, somebody asked about, you know, whether they'd be disadvantaged. And I think um, my sense is that we are training you to be clinical psychologists in 2020, 2021, et cetera. And the ways, however you were trained, it's going to fit with however services are being delivered at the time because you're working in our services. Um, and so your training will be in sync with what the NHS needs you to be able to do and to be competent to do. Um, so whilst you will undoubtedly come out more competent in working within a digital framework than people would have done 10 years ago, and that's going to mean that you're more aligned and in step with, with how our health services will be delivered um, because the services are changing as well as the training. Okay, I think we've got time for maybe two more questions. So I'm going to focus the first one around teaching and the second one around the additional support that might be there. So the teaching, I'm going to merge the questions together. We've got, um, in thinking about teaching, has it been difficult to access materials if it's been remote? Has there been any particular um, teaching areas that are going to be prioritised for face-to-face? Do we think that in the future it's going to be more virtual anyway and that might be really helpful for traveling? Um, and a question about funding and is there a likelihood that external teaching is going to be cut over the next couple of years? Was that too many? I, Anybody want to start us I, off? I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to be able to remember all those, Katie, but some of the things that will be prioritised are, as Alex says already, um, neuropsych. Uh, teaching will be prioritised in terms of being face-to-face. -face. Um, parts of the induction block so that you guys can meet each other um, will be being prioritised. We, we have a huge issue at UEL in terms of space, um, big enough rooms to, to house you all in a socially distanced way. So we've been um, representing the need for that since April and it's still ongoing. So um, at the moment we're prioritising our first years, our incoming first years for the face-to-face -face stuff. So that's you guys um, who are coming to UEL. I uh, can't remember the other bits now, Katie, sorry. Gone, too late. External teaching for the future. Yeah. Will it still be there? Mm. So a lot of courses, a lot of universities have had a real um, crisis this year. And um, as you'll know, some of us were even helping with clearing for the last two weeks. That was a bit of a joy. Um, so yeah, it's I, I. That's not been specifically talked about um, locally. So I, I don't really know yet. Um, yeah, I can't really comment on that specifically. Tony, do you want to add in there? Yeah, I, I just I used to be pro vice chancellor at a university, so on the senior management team. So she's used to dealing with this, and it's definitely true that the university sector as a whole has had a quite a hit this year. A combination of international student recruitment um, taking a, a big dip. Um, uh, also, there's the the, the 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 birth rate of 18 is at a low point at the moment. So a num um, there's been other funding losses with European um, research funding. So universities are having a quite a, a tricky time yet. But the advantage about the clinical programs are that they are specifically funded by the NHS with a fee that usually goes to the university, although sometimes some of the money goes to uh, a local NHS trust to pay staff. But it has enabled some sort of protection of budgets in a way that if you're teaching on, on, on an undergraduate program with not that kind of specific funding, it, it's slightly less protected. So a lot of the the, the organizer the directors were working quite hard to sort of 
kind of protect their budget. Mm. I mean, nobody can be absolutely sure, but by and large, I think the external teach, this is external teachers coming in to teach, that budget will be uh, quite protected, yeah. uh, particularly as clinical programs rely on those external teachers more than say an undergraduate program where typically all the teaching is done only by the university staff. So I think it is a bit more protective. Yeah. And to, to add to that, from the BPS um, perspective, in order for our training programs to meet the training standards, they have to demonstrate various things. And one of those is that there's a sufficient range of expertise to deliver the teaching. And so that's one of the one of the areas that can be really helpful for programs um, in making their case to the university for continuing to employ external teachers, people from the NHS to come in and deliver a specialist teaching. So our training standards in that sense are, are really helpful um, for the training programs. The other way the training standards are helpful is they specify a, specify a staff to student ratio yeah. that you can't go below and maintain your accreditation. And I think that has proved a kind of very useful um, standard for um, course directors to argue within their own universities. Thank you all. And then from a trainee perspective, is there, um, have you had any difficulties accessing resources? I was just gonna say um, difficulty. I think the thing for me was kind of when lockdown happened, I wasn't at home. But I think for me, one of the big things that I would say about teaching is how do you learn best face to face? So, for example, for me, it's having the PowerPoints in front of me and scribbling notes all over them, um, as opposed to kind of just trying to do it on a blank sheet of paper. And I think kind of going forward, I'm going to make certain that I've got a printer so I can print those things out. So trying to replicate the kind of face-to-face -face teaching experience as much as possible but thinking about resources so that was kind of an area where I didn't have it because normally kind of there's the printers at university and things like that and I just didn't have a printer at home um, but I think resource wise so much of the resources I'd have got would have been from the university or we've got a thing called Vital at Liverpool I don't know whether it's the same kind of across unis or whether other universities got different things but kind of people put resources up there and I think that the university library um kind of has gone more in terms of like ebooks and things like this and I know at one point I think it was Cambridge um University Press they like put up a code so you could get all of their books um ebooks for free and things like that so I think in some ways getting resources has been easier in COVID um but yeah, but I would say kind of in terms of the support and kind of learning and there was a question around the learning styles and things like this. And for me, it's think about how you learn face to face and then replicate that online. Thanks, Camilla. Anybody else? No. OK, um, the last question was thinking about has um, supervision, whether that be formal or informal, changed um, during kind of the coronavirus time and, and where do we see that going in the future and I think actually that's quite a nice way to um, end the webinar thinking about support in general especially for the new intake trainees. Um, Alex? Yeah I think um, I think it's definitely changed um, you, we're not having those conversations in the corridors we maybe are less getting to know our supervisors in a different way as opposed to how we would conventionally kind of see them and and they're they're not kind of necessarily around as much but actually I think it's really important to address these things early in supervision at the moment and I think generally trainees that I've spoken to have really had this from their supervisors and they've acknowledged that there's a difference in that and there's a shift in how you can access your supervisor I suppose and so there's a much more kind of texting them ringing them um, kind of booking in zoom meetings you might be booking in more regular supervision because there are things that maybe you um, are having to hold for a different period of time but I suppose it's changed and not not necessarily lessened what I've noticed is for, for me I've actually been much more likely to text my supervisor because they've named it and been much more open about please text me if you need to speak to me because there's a, a potential barrier there whereas in pre-covid times those barriers do still exist but they're less in the face and maybe less likely to be discussed so 
that's been my experience. I don't know if other trainees or supervisors had similar experiences. I think it's definitely, yeah, I was going to say, I think it's definitely changed in that it was about four months in when I eventually met my supervisor for the first time face to face. Um, and so that was quite weird to realize that she was an actual human being. Um, and I know some people in my cohort haven't met their supervisors and kind of placement ends in a couple of weeks. So kind of that's been a big difference. Um, I think that there's kind of naming it. I've found that I've become a bit more, not necessarily needy, but kind of she gets a lot more emails than would normally happen. So I'm kind of like, this is where all my clients are up to kind of, because it feels there's that sense of missing in the corridor and things like that. Um, but I think kind of wider support structures is really important and kind of thinking about and making use of them all. So it doesn't just have to be your supervisor, but thinking about people at university, kind of personal tutors. And I think, I mean, I'm, I'm going to say this, I could be wrong, but I think at Liverpool, um, there's been more contact with personal tutors. And I think that's kind of been the same in kind of quite a lot of the universities. Um, contacts with people like if you get given mentors in your university or kind of buddies, people in the year above, kind of keeping in contact with them. And I think that imposter syndrome can be a real thing. And I think the thing that's really important about it is kind of if you need support, kind of accessing it and kind of going for it as early as you can but um I think one of the things to say is that everybody's worked with a supervisor generally at some point in their career to get onto clinical training and the relationship is different but there's definitely similarities um, whether you meet them face to face or not fantastic okay I'm aware that we've got two minutes left so are there any final comments from anybody going to wrap it up okay so I'd just like to say thank you to everybody for taking the time out to either present tonight or sit and watch us present um, I hope it's been helpful for everybody I hope it's validated some of the concerns that you may have got you a bit excited about starting um, and I think you should all congratulate yourselves and be really um, excited about starting because we're all sending you the best of luck mm -hmm. um, and we're all here. So a couple of us have popped our email addresses into the chat if you want to contact us. The um, collaborative group is going to continue. Um, so anything that is a training issue that you think we should be aware of and liaise with key stakeholders, do let us know. Um, and thank you very much. Good luck.